Hello, my dear online fam, and welcome to Catamania. If you've been following me for a while, you probably know by now that I am obsessed with everything related to the power of our subconscious mind, psychology, and just in general, how the world works. The whole idea behind this podcast was that no one really knows what's going on, and we're all figuring it out. So I would love to talk to as many people as I can who have it figured out in a certain area of expertise or whom I just find interesting to share what it is that they are doing, how they're doing it, and what they figured out in a certain area. So in this episode, I interviewed Flynn Skidmore. Flynn is a therapist whom I found online and I really resonated with his content. He takes very complex ideas from you know business, entrepreneurship, to relationships, money, trauma, and explains them all in very concise, very simple, but also deep and descriptive ways, if that makes sense. So he goes, he dives really deep into each one of those subjects, but he does it in a very simple way. So it's actually easy to understand. So I was like, I have to have him on and I have to chat with him. And the two main subjects that I really wanted to discuss with him, which I discussed in this episode, were money and trauma related to money, as well as the victimhood mentality and the drama triangle, which he goes deep into describing. But aside from that, I had a really lovely conversation with him just around the idea of, you know, fulfillment, feeling satisfied in life, feeling happy, um, working in the corporate world and how it might actually not be the worst idea for some people entrepreneurship and the value of being an entrepreneur and the rewards that you get with stepping into that journey. And I think you're really going to love this podcast. No matter what it is that you are doing in life, I feel like the subject of fulfillment, satisfaction, happiness, finances, wealth, money is something that is pretty much on everyone's mind, at least from, from what I have seen in the world. So if you enjoyed this episode and if you enjoy my podcast, Feel free to give it five stars or thumbs up, depending on whatever platform you're listening to this on. And come say hi to me on Instagram with my handle being Christina Cataman, C-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-C-A-T-A-M-A-N. Enjoy and stay blessed. I moved out here for, I moved out here two years ago. There's been a little bit more than two years. What made you move? So I... Primarily, it was surfing. I wanted to be able to surf regularly, um, but I, when COVID hit, or like it, around in the fall of COVID 2020, I kind of found myself in a place where, for the first time in my life, it felt like I could really make a choice about what I wanted to do. Um, everything else up until that point felt like, I don't know, it felt like I had to do all of these things. And I had never found myself in a position where it's like, wow, what do I want? What do I want to do? What's the best version of what I want? And at that point, it was just moving to California to be able to surf all the time and live a life where there's sunshine is what I wanted to do. I had just left a relationship. Um, and my business had gone fully remote because of COVID. So I had this freedom and I chose to come, come here. I really love hearing success stories from COVID. And there are so many. Like when we were all in it, it felt like the whole world was falling apart. But I'm meeting so many people these days who made the biggest breakthrough in their careers or their lives during COVID. And I'm like, humans are awesome. I love that, you know? Right? And I so you so lived too. in New York City before mm -hmm. that? Yeah. yeah, I grew so up in Brooklyn. That's a huge change. Well, so I grew up in Brooklyn and then I was living in Philly at the time of COVID because um, I went to grad school in Philly. So I came here from Philly. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. And Thank how you. how did you end up down the path of therapy? Are you a licensed therapist? So I'm yeah. licensed in Pennsylvania, um, but because of social media and because of moving states, like the way that I see it, honestly, is a therapy license is basically a marketing strategy. I know that some people might not agree with that, but it just like lends credibility, right? And so right. when I 
found myself in a position where I was gaining an audience on social media and people were experiencing me as credible with or without a license. Like I just didn't need to use it anymore. And in fact, I find using licensure to be super limiting in a lot of ways. So license in Pennsylvania, I don't even know if that license exists anymore. I haven't done anything to it for a few years. Um, and now just practicing, like mostly what I'm doing with people would be considered coaching and I'm using all of the stuff from therapy that I would be using. Oh, so that's actually cool because you're combining into coaching the stuff that you would use in therapy. Exactly. That's awesome. Yeah. And I'm and sure, okay, may I ask you something? Yeah, of course. I'm curious to know because... I'm curious about what you see as the distinction between coaching and therapy. Like what to you is therapy? Well, that's actually a really, really good question because I feel like I haven't done one-on-one -on -one therapy ever. I'm considering it because I think it has a lot of really great, um, well, re just really great things that come out of it. I have family members who have gone through it and friends and it, it was life-changing for them. But I have gone through some coaching and maybe, and this is like a very generic idea that I can think of. Therapy is a little, it goes a little bit deeper than coaching. Like coaching is more about accountability, setting goals, identifying your limits and your limiting beliefs, and then like eliminating them. Whereas mm -hmm. traditionally what it seems to me like therapy is all about identifying your limitations, traumas, and like going deep into them and healing them. And then, mm -hmm. you know, going to the next step of like setting goals and building like a new life from mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what it seems to me. Is that kind of what, what it is to you as well? I think so. I, th I, my sense with the, okay. So coaching is like goal setting, accountability, work through limiting beliefs to get those goals. Therapy is like going deep into childhood experiences, healing on a deep level, and then creating changes in your life that you might not have even considered had you not done that type of healing. Is that yeah. kind of how you're seeing it? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's pretty good. I think that's pretty good. I think, I think, um, I actually don't really know the distinction, you know? So it's, interesting to hear how different people see it in a lot of ways. Like what I learned, what I was trained in as a therapist was to be a really good listener, um, and provide unconditional love and support, which I think are really, really helpful. Um, and also a bunch of techniques and skills to help people explore their subconscious and their conditioning. But I really do believe that without the ambitious goal setting, that that stuff is not all that useful. I think it is the magic happens when those things like the deep healing is applied to something extraordinary, to 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 being able to engage in a process of creating something extraordinary in our lives. Otherwise, I think people feel a lot of stuckness when it's just about what we would call healing. And then do you have a specialty? Do all therapists have a, like a specialized area that they focus on? That's a great question. Yeah, I think so. I like some people will focus on relationships. Um, a lot of, a lot of how therapists distinguish themselves or differentiate themselves is through a particular modality. So a lot of therapists would be like body oriented psychotherapists, which is seeing, trauma in the body and working with the body to help create change. Other therapists would be more cognitive. So trying to change thoughts in order to change outcomes. Um, I use a bit of everything. What I'm mostly interested in, what I really like doing is helping entrepreneurs, helping business people like get clear on their biggest vision for what they want their business to be and creating that and identifying blockages along the way, like seeing what comes up along the way in that process. 
and using their vehicle like are using their business as a vehicle for the transformation that they want. And in that process, I'm using cognitive stuff, hypnosis stuff, a lot of body stuff, a lot of um, stuff from this called internal family systems, which I think is the best therapeutic modality. Um, so that's kind of the broad landscape of specialties and modalities. Mm. So kind of the focus then would be, helping entrepreneurs. Am I understanding that correctly? People who That's want what to... I really like doing. Yeah. What made you specifically decide to do that? It's, a, it's, um, it's funny that you asked that because I was just thinking this morning, the thought just, just occurred to me this morning that I've never had a job with a corporation. Um, all way, as soon as I got out of school, I started doing business stuff, entrepreneurial stuff. Um, it's just, I think for me, um, the, the paths that are given to it, like the prescription for happiness that's given to us, the systems that are given to us don't really work to create satisfaction and fulfillment. Um, I was never a person who thought to myself, oh, if I just do this, this, and this, then I'll be happy. And it actually shocks me when people do think that, oh, you just go to college and then you get a job and then you'd be happy. Um, it, it just, my, there's something about my soul that rejected that from a really young age and understood that I had to create my own systems in order to be satisfied and fulfilled. And so, for me, entrepreneurship is this tool that allows us to be able to design the life that we want with as much agility as possible. It's more about that than I think it is business, but I do love business. So I think for people who are looking to live extraordinarily enriching lives, um, I, th I think the best way to do that is to be an entrepreneur. So there's a deeper meaning to it. It's not it, the entrepreneurship is kind of like the the I guess the surface of it, but it's about fulfillment, like helping people to be more fulfilled. Do you believe that some people actually do feel fulfilled in the corporate world? Like for some people, it's meant that or they're meant to work a nine to five, and that's because you know really you hear so question. much. Yeah, you hear so much. Like especially I on my podcast, I talk mainly to entrepreneurs or to psychologists or to people who are definitely doing like their own thing and they're not really in the traditional system. And I thought about that the other day because I I worked a nine to five until just about two years ago, both mm -hmm. my husband and I, and I was thinking about it. I'm like, you know, I definitely knew that I wasn't going to do it forever. But I did have some coworkers who I looked at and I was like, I think you actually get a drive from it. Like you, you, I don't know if you would do well outside of here. It mm -hmm. actually suits you. But I think we almost go too far on the side of like, well, you need to break away from nine to five. Otherwise, you know, it's going to crush your soul and you're not going to feel fulfilled. And it's like, it's true probably for like most people. Mm -hmm. But it, do you believe that there are people who actually are meant to be in the corporate world? I would I, like, I, so when we say, when we say meant to where my mind goes is, okay, well then there's some, there's some external entity that has a plan in place for some people are meant to do this. And, and I, maybe that's true, but I don't know if that's true, that there's some plan for, for people. Um, the thing that I'm most interested in is asking people like, do you like your life? And exploring that question. What do you like about your life? What don't you like about your life? Like, are you willing to spend your life pursuing as much enrichment and fulfillment as you might like? Um, and if a person who's in a nine to five job, like if that works for them for as much fulfillment and satisfaction as they want, like I would support that 1 million percent. So I don't think that there is a prescription for happiness and fulfillment, and that doesn't include nine to five. I just don't often see it. I don't often see people who are in a nine to five corporate world who are extraordinarily fulfilled and satisfied. I'm mostly seeing it from entrepreneurs. Right. Makes sense. Because usually, you, yeah, like you said, you design your own thing as an entrepreneur. Exactly. As to. Do you find people are 
just scared of going down the entrepreneurial path? Like you mentioned that you pretty much right away knew that you weren't going to do anything else. What about those who, like me two years ago, I was like, I'm really scared. I'm going to do it because I don't really have anything to lose per se. But people who are like, I know that I'm meant to break away from what I'm doing now and start something on my own and do something of my own. But I like, I have bills to pay. I have, you know, family to feed and all of that. What would you, what would you say to them? Well, I think it really depends on the person. Um, well, maybe what would be the most valuable thing was to explore the things that you were afraid of. I was definitely afraid of the instability because mm -hmm. there's definitely that picture of, well, I know for sure that two weeks from now, my paycheck is going to come and right. I'm going to have a certain amount of money and it's really uncomfortable to, you know, not have that anymore. Yeah. And have you found stability two years later or have you found? I would say it's not necessarily the stability, but more so like the reward for the risk mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's a huge risk and the yes. reward for it, you know, can be zero for a while. And it was, but after, after a certain period of time, you're like, oh, wow, the reward is actually like greater than what I would get from my right. job. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense to me. So in one framework, like the, the limit of your idea of safety was, oh, paycheck that's coming in every two weeks. When you stepped out of that framework and into this other framework, you're saying like, oh, that's one form of safety, but actually this other thing is way safer. Even though there's more risk involved, it it's it's more rewarding, it's more fulfilling, and therefore it's more it's more safe than the other thing. I think that's the that is the thing is like everyone is operating within a framework with a baseline level of love, safety, and belonging. And that love, safety, and belonging works for that framework. So in a nine to five framework, like the safety of the stability works for being there. But if, if, if someone is willing to take the risk to step into a different framework, I find that what they can do is actually elevate their experience of safety. So we think not having a paycheck come in every two weeks is not safe. But just like you're saying, the rewards of everything else create a new version of safety for you that is so much more fulfilling than the previous version of safety. Right. Like even a level of confidence too, that you're able to just start from zero and then build something for sure. I think that that whole safety thing ties a little bit my husband and I talk about that a lot. So both of us are immigrants. His, he immigrated here with his family and I immigrated here by myself. And so we talk about actually how beautiful it is to live in a society where you have access to credit. Like, you know, mm -hmm. that, that idea that if you enter into the system, you have a stable job and a stable income. I'm pretty sure it's very similar in the United States as it is in Canada, but you know, you don't have to work too long. You just have to have a you know, good job, what considered to be a good job with stable income to have access to credit. And then you mm. can get, you know, mortgage, you can get, um, you can finance a vehicle in many places in the world. You can do that. Like even mm. where I'm from you, I'm pretty sure you can get a mortgage now, but the rates are like insane. Most people save up and then they buy stuff. There, there, mm. there isn't a culture or a possibility to get something with you know, the trust from the company or the bank that you are going to pay it off. And there's obviously debate on which way is better. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. But as someone who comes from a place where, you know, I've seen people live with their parents until they were like older, you know, <laughs> until they were finally able to save up and move out and then move with their other half or their wife or their husband, whatever, right? To actually have the privacy and stuff like that. Whereas here it's like, well, I can just, I can just move out and like buy a place or rent Whoa. a place. Yeah. So it's, it's, I think my idea of safety and security was attached to that. Like, well, if I, if I don't have that, if I break away from it, because to be able to, let's say buy a house, um, without like a stable employment, without being an employee of a company is much harder, right? As an entrepreneur, you have to show like, I think three years of, or a year, I don't know exactly how it is, um, of stable 
income, monthly income. So I think my idea of safety was attached to that. Mm. So when you said that now, I, I, the reason why I'm saying that is because I think a lot of listeners, because I have a lot of um, immigrants in Canada and the United States who are, who are my followers. So I think they'll really resonate with it because a lot of them, I get a lot of messages like, well, how did you, how did you start a podcast? Like, how did you and your husband decide to embark on the journey of entrepreneurship? Like, how did you do it? And I just now realized what was my biggest fear. It's like that, that idea of I'm not going to be able to be part of the system anymore, which is, I mean, it's temporarily maybe true, but it's not really uh, true in the long run if you work at it and you have a reward. So as I'm mentioning that, actually, the one of the main things that I want to talk to you about was you have a video where you talk about money and trauma around money. Mm -hmm. Let's dive into that a little bit, because I feel like almost every person in the world wants to be richer and and wealthier and live a better life. What is trauma around money and how do I identify what those traumas are? It's a great, it's a great question. So one of the things that comes up a lot with money is that people have been conditioned to reject other people who want or have money because the rejection of people who have money creates in group belonging for the people who don't have money. Right. And, you know, it's actually like, I actually find that to be a really beautiful survival mechanism. So almost like psychological, social, and spiritual survival. Um, if, if a group is an oppressed or an, or marginalized group, creating culture is a really important survival skill, right? Culture in that, in that sense of belonging is really, really important. And for a lot of people, their sense of belonging, their identity is to reject people who pursue a life where they have money or make a lot of money, right? So it's this, it's this really treacherous, shitty thing where you, you get the safety of the in-group belonging by rejecting people who want money, but you do want money. And you are not allowing yourself to pursue that because if you were, then you would be leaving the group that you currently belong to. So that's what I see as a lot of what gets in the way of people pursuing a life where they get to make a lot of money is that they're spending energy judging what it means to be a person who wants money. Resenting others. Resenting, resenting it. Yeah. Being spiteful and, and bitter. And of course, there are ways of making money that are harmful to the world. I, I mean, may, I don't know this to be true, but maybe most of the ways of making a lot of money are currently harmful to the world. Um, I don't think that that has to be true, though. Like, I think that it can be true where you're making a lot of money and being really intentional about what you're doing to be making that money and how it's influencing and impacting others. So I do get the rejection of it. Like the pursuit of making a lot of money often has people easily dehumanizing other people and other things. A really simple example would be like in the industrial revolution, like we didn't give a fuck about the environment because it was just this desperate pursuit for more money. And like, created all of these environmental problems that were so short sighted, you know, that's what happens in the desperate pursuit of money. So I definitely get rejecting that. But I think a lot of the thing with money is if a person wants to be making a lot of money, it's really important for them to create their own model of what it means to be a person who is uh, aligned with their values while also still making a lot of money, which is a very possible thing. And how do you identify if you have a trauma? Would that then be the first step is, are you resenting somebody who's wealthier than you are? That's a great question. And, and yes, like, I think, uh, if you find yourself resent, if you find yourself living a certain life, if, uh, if you find yourself seeing people who are living a certain lifestyle and you're judging that. I would use that judgment to become curious about what it is that you're actually judging and how that judgment is serving you. Most of the time, 
when we're judging certain things that we see outside of ourselves, it, it, we, there's, we want what we're seeing, but we don't believe that it's available for us. So a way that we keep ourselves safe is to reject that thing. So if, if you start to see, not you, but a person, if a person yeah. starts to see their judgment as, as like a trailhead, as, as a, a starting place to apply curiosity to whom, what about that? What about that person's life inspires me? Like, what do I like about that? The more that we can allow ourselves to want what it is that we want, the easier it is to live a life that is highly satisfying and fulfilling. The thing is though, is like, what we want is not actually the money or the yachts or like any of those things. What we want are the feelings that we think we'll have access to when we have those things. Is that what I'm saying? So, yeah. So to, I think, I mean, I've always followed that to cultivate the feeling within you first. And then usually, usually the financial thing will follow, right? The financial ability to, to, I guess, make it manifest in your life, except for the private jet. I still haven't gotten that. Well, there's yeah, actually quite a few <laughs> things that I haven't gotten yet, but <laughs> I still need to cultivate that feeling a little bit, a little bit stronger. <laughs> And what about financial ceilings? What's your opinion on that? Like when we have a set, an idea of fixed income, uh, let's say someone's listening to this and they're like, you know, I, I just, I, I'm making, you know, 50 or $80,000 a year and that's all I can make, but I want to make mm -hmm. more. I would say that our subconscious will only ever have what it is familiar with. So if a person is familiar with anxiety and like frustration in relationships, then unless they actively try to change what they're familiar with, then they will continue to have relationships that are fueled by anxiety and frustration, right? Same thing with money. If we are familiar with $80,000 a year, then and we're not doing something to actively change our familiarity then either we're going to stay there forever or grow really really slower than we might like right and there's no like there's no right or wrong pace but there is a pace that's either satisfying or dissatisfying to you what what i found with money is that the more that i was in a place i was just thinking about this this morning the more that I was in a place where I was trying to speed things up, the harder it was to make more money, you know? And so I would like fight and fight and fight and try and make more money, make more money. What, what ended up really helping me, I was working with this guy who's my coach who I've worked with for a long time. He's amazing. He's like, um, I was kind of in this like urgent and desperate place to make more money. And he was like, well, how much more money do you want to make? And I didn't even know how much more, I just wanted the idea of more money. And then what we ended up doing was we got really specific and we were like, okay, so you want to be making, I don't remember how much it was, $10,000 more per month. Okay. So what's your plan? Like, what's your plan to make this specific amount more per month? Okay. I'll do that plan. And as I'm doing that plan, I'm getting familiar with the actions required in order to increase how much I'm making. And then as I make more, then I make that certain amount per month. And all of a sudden, I make that certain amount per month once, twice, three times, four times. And that just becomes who I am. Now, the idea of making less than that is like, even if I were to spend six months making less than that, I know deep in my bones that I can easily get back there, you know, and you, and you probably hear people speaking about that. Like I could lose everything, be dropped off in a country in South America where I don't know the language and I could make it back. Um, so it's about identifying how much more you'd like to be making, getting clear on the specific steps to make that much more, doing those things. And then as that happens, you become familiar with that amount of money. And once you're familiar with it, it's it's easy for your subconscious to have it. And what if, um, I love talking about money, so I could talk about it this whole day, but what if someone is listening to this and they're like, okay, this is great, but like, I feel like I have no skills. I feel like I have no way to deliver value and I want to be making, you know, $10,000 a month. Uh, 
Yeah. I know I'm capable because I can, I can work. I'm a hard worker, but I just feel like I have no skills. Where do I start? What plan do I draft? So I have never met a person who's not interesting. I think I just have it. I think every single person is interesting. And the beautiful thing about entrepreneurship is that what it actually is, well, it doesn't have to be this. You can make a lot of money and like be a shithead forever. But one of the things that it does give us the opportunity to do is learn how to be yourself. The more you are learning how to be yourself and do things despite being scared of them and like just be the version of yourself that you want to be like who I like to be is like really kind, funny, like laughing all the time. The more I'm practicing being that version of myself, the more money I seem to make. Right. It, that is just what seems to happen. And it's this like crazy thing where it's, I find that the more time I'm investing in doing things that fill me up and bring me joy, surfing, playing tennis, snowboarding, the more money I make. So what I would say is that making money gets to be, it doesn't have to be, but it gets to be a practice of a person learning to be their most joyful magnetic self. And the more, for, I think that the more a person takes a look at the things in their life that light them up the most and look at their experience, like how did they struggle with that particular thing? What was their process of getting good at that particular thing? And it doesn't even need to be a skill like data analysis. It can be something like making people laugh. The more a person studies themselves and their own experience and sees their process of going from not that good at something to good at something, the more successful that person can be. There's a market for any anything. Like, like if, the, if, if a person were like, I used to hate my hair and I would try and straighten it every day because I had curly hair, but now I love my curly hair and here's what I do. Here's my process with that. That person could make $10 million a year. So it's really, I think the thing is like owning the things that are the most important to you is the thing that ultimately translates as being able to make a lot of money as an entrepreneur. So I think you gave a really good explanation for something that I know a lot of people, myself included, I used to get really frustrated about that when people would say, well, just do what you love and you'll make money eventually. You know, and people are like, well, okay, I'm going to go pet my dog and like sit on my couch <laughs> and, you know, then I'm just going to wait. And it's like, well, no, there's a lot more to it. There are things that, you know, make you feel fulfilled that you love to do, but you still have to do them, right? There are the things that will give you energy. There are the things that will you know, kind of like light a fire inside of you to do other things. And then it'll kind of, you know, keep on becoming this bigger and bigger thing. Even like with surfing, you're saying I've never surfed, I would like to try. Mm -hmm. But you know, it brings so much joy to people and people love to do it. But in order to get on a wave and serve, there's so much work that you had to do to actually learn it, right? Yeah. So it's I think people misunderstand that because all they hear is like, well, do what you love and the money will follow. Yes, but there's more to it, right? Like there's there's this whole thing. <laughs> exactly. So I just, I put out this video maybe a couple of weeks ago um, on, I can't remember what it was on, but something about like, if you don't perceive yourself as desirable, which I like a lot of people struggle with not seeing themselves as lovable or desirable. And what works for me and what seems to work for a lot of people is setting extraordinary goals. There's this concept from um, Naval Ravikant, who's one of my favorite people. I, I'm so smart, love him so much. Um, and he speaks about this thing where like, if you choose three things that you love, it could be reading, petting your dog and going on walks. The, those probably aren't amazing examples, but if you choose three things that you love and you commit to being top 10% in the world at those three things, there's probably not another person in the world who's also top 10% in those three exact things. So it is about finding what you love. I, I would, I think it's more than just like, yeah, do what you love. I think it's more about like, Find what lights you up that you feel driven to be really good at. Because 
if you're not really good at things, you probably won't make a lot of money. It is about being highly ambitious and having extraordinary goals, like being top 10% in the world at something with most things that's not actually measurable, but it's more uh, qualitative, you know, um, pursue that, get really good at that thing. And all of a sudden you make yourself into a very scarce and rare resource because honestly, yes, it's about getting really good at surfing or getting really good at doing your hair. But what it's really about is being a person who knows what it takes to get really good at something. That's the thing that matters the most. Like I have this friend of mine, really like one of my best friends and he makes a lot of music and he's also a coach. And he was telling me about how he like feels guilty because his mu it's not clear to him how his music is going to make him money. And we were talking about it. It was like, yeah, but you're becoming one of the most skilled music producers in the world. I mean, not maybe not top 0.001%, but definitely top 10%. And it is, even if his music is never going to make him money, the experience of getting really good at something will make him money because getting good at anything applies, the principles in there apply to all things. Yeah, well, for sure. I think it's also that whole idea of consistency, right? When people say, well, I've tried something, but it didn't work. Like I've tried to become good, but it didn't work. It's like, but how much did you try? Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you quit like right mm -hmm. after? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think especially, I don't know, I, I hear more and more, unfortunately, lately is like to go back to even resentment that you were talking about towards people who have more. There's a sense of resentment towards people who have made it and people who are doing well. And it's like, well, they're just lucky or they're just they they were you know born in the right place or into the right family and most people who are really really successful at what they do in that top 10% if you really follow their journey it was not at all like that they had to work for what they have right they had mm -hmm. to work on becoming the best at what they do so this mm -hmm. resentment is just i feel like put, it's putting up a wall between you and your own good right and you actually being good at something so how does that tie to i know you posted another video that I really, um, I really liked. You were talking about the victimhood mentality and mm -hmm. the drama triangle. Mm -hmm. How does, how does that work in the sense of, you know, how detrimental is the victimhood mentality? How do you recognize that you're in that space or in that state? And how does that tie to resentment towards people who seem to have what you don't have? That's an amazing question. So First, let's, we'll break down the drama triangle really quick so people can understand. So in the drama triangle, there's a hero, a perpetrator, and a victim. The victim is experiencing the perpetrator as doing something to them that they don't want them to be doing. Um, the hero comes to save the victim and the victim wants to be saved by the hero. Um, and to save the victim, the hero has to fight the perpetrator. Um, so the, the, the problem with the accountability or the drama triangle is that no one is taking accountability for their experience and no one is taking accountability for the way that they are perpetuating the experience or the circumstances. And they're all blaming the other parts of the drama triangle, right? So the more blame that we have in our system, the more we're blaming anything, the less likely we are to change anything. I feel like and that's how communism is born. Because you're describing literally like USSR, you know, like people were just blaming one another and, and like the government was the, the, the hero supposedly. Right. But mm -hmm. that's how it starts. Cause you have no responsibility, no accountability. You just wait for somebody to come save you. Yeah, exactly. Right. And the, and the more that we're doing that, the thing is like, I think we, we all do that. The drama triangle has probably been around for as long as humans has, have had language, probably even longer. And you could even make really crazy metaphysical arguments for how the drama triangle probably predates the existence of humans, right? It's this like interesting, deeply embedded thing into 
our unconscious. And I do think that what we get to do is spend our lives unwinding the hold that the drama triangle has on us because it is in each of us. And like when, when I'm being a hero, I'm also being a victim and a perpetrator. It's not just one or the other, you know what I mean? So if I'm in an, an environment where I'm being a hero and I'm seeing a victim outside of me, I'm also experiencing all three of those roles inside of myself. And there's all this blame. It's essentially just a mechanism for avoiding accountability and avoiding creating really effective, clean, efficient change. So that's kind of the, the overview of the drama triangle. It's not bad. I wouldn't consider anything to be bad. It's just not as effective for creating change as is taking really strong accountability and personal responsibility. Do you have to have all three then to not be able to take accountability or how does that work? Or are you, can you be like more dominant in one area than the other and still not take account? Like if you're mainly a hero, are uh -huh. you still not taking accountability or is it just when you're in the victim? Oh yeah. Even in the, I'm so glad you asked that. Yeah. Even in the hero, even in the hero position. So like a, a good example of this is I, um, so I had my sister come move in with me. Um, and I had all these expectations for like how I was going to help her grow her business and all these things. Right. And it was like, it was kind and loving. And also there were all of these, like, um, all of these hero elements to it. Right. All these savior elements to it. So especially as a then, brother. Especially yeah. as a brother, right? So then when when like certain expectations weren't being met and all that, like I started to get really, really frustrated with things. And so because I'm the hero who wants to save this person, I'm also seeing this person as not living up to my expectations as perpetrating against me. So then I'm also the victim of this person who's not living up to my expectations. And then that builds and builds and builds. And so then sometimes I become the perpetrator also, and I get pissed off and I yell and I do whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So all three things are in me and all of the blame, like blaming myself, blaming her, blaming something else, all of that just ensures that the same things keep happening over and over and over again. And if I want something to actually change, well, that like how to change and what to change is like a whole other thing. But if I want something to change, it is wise to recognize that I'm playing into the drama triangle and to make a choice to step out of it. How do you step out of it? So a big, a big part of it is apology. So if I'm blaming something or like other people for my experience, um, it is why I'm, if I'm, if I'm holding onto that blame, it's like, I'm holding onto this energetic tie between me and them in that situation. And I'm giving them the power over my experience. I'm saying like, unless this person changes what they're doing, I'll never be able to change my experience or what I'm doing. And so like a very powerful thing to do, even if someone has hurt me, I will apologize to that person for blaming them for things that I've experienced that I see as connected to how they might hurt me. I'll also apologize to myself. And apology is not like, it's not like me blaming something else and now I'm blaming myself. It's more the energy of like, I was seeing things this way. Now I'm seeing things this way. When I was seeing things this way, it was creating this experience that I didn't like. Here's the experience I would like to be having. I apologize for how I was contributing to that experience. Here's what I want to do to have this experience. So the apology is just this like strong personal responsibility energy that cuts those blame ties and opens up opportunity for change. Then we get into like how to create change and what that is, which is a really interesting thing. But I'll give you an example of like um, in tennis, for instance, I have this tendency of not playing as good as I actually am. And I can feel myself 
not wanting to fully unleash because I don't want to like, humiliate other people. Right. But that is me thinking that I can humiliate other people. If I'm going in there saying I'm going to humiliate this person, that's what I want to do. That's one thing. But if I'm going in and saying, I just want to enjoy this, like if my, if I am thinking that I am going to create a, an experience of humiliation for this other person, that's a whole lot of egocentrism. That's a whole lot of like paying attention to myself, thinking that I'm influencing this other person's experience. They can choose however they would like to experience being beat. They can choose to be humiliated or they can choose to be excited about it because it gives them opportunities to be better. So even with stuff like that, all apologize because I'm being like a hero saving them from their experience, the opponent. Does that make sense? So I, I'm personally practicing finding all of the ways that I'm doing that kind of stuff and always apologizing. And it doesn't even, I'm never going to like go to those players and say, I'm sorry. It's more of like, I was just going to say, when you say yeah. apologizing, do you actually go up and say, I'm so sorry that I won? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And it's not about the sorry about winning. It's the, I apologize for, I apologize for like thinking that I could create your experience, thinking that me winning would create your experience. I apologize for like putting all of that influence on myself. Um, and it's more of an internal practice. And the way that I've been taught to do it and the way that I think about it is like, if you really want to cut those blame ties, then you'll sit in a chair and you and you practice apologizing. Like, I apologize. Thank you. I love you over and over until you feel something shift in your body, until you feel it let go. And when you feel that thing let go, you then create the opportunity to create change. And you can measure that neurologically, like the more relaxed you are, the more open your uh, brain synapses are to receive new information. The more tense you are, uh, the more likely you are to play out the same patterns over and over. Mm. Yeah, I really like that. So it's, it's more so even just like just practicing total openness to the experience, right? Like being showing up in your full or yeah, with your full potential and just being totally open to the outcome. Exactly. I was just thinking like, um, you know, when you were saying sometimes you like downplay your own skills. And I was just thinking, like, if Novak Djokovic, like, downplays his own skills just because he'd right. feel bad, right? Or, like, right. Kyrgios or all of these tennis players would be like, you know what? I just, like, don't want to humiliate this person by right. winning. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. you can see, like, like if you're ever watching a match before, um, like, before they go out there in the tunnel and, and, you know, they're, like, standing next to each other. And it's a really interesting thing because you get to see the body language of these two people who are about to go head to head at the highest level. And when you see Nadal in the tunnel, he is a killer. Like he is, he's already won. You can just see it in the body language and the, whoever he's playing often tends to look apologetic. And maybe those people do have the skills to beat him, but you can just see in their body that they're shying away from winning. Whereas he is like, in the zone like no one else I've ever seen. So interesting. So are you, this is like totally off topic, but are you a Djokovic or a Nadal friend? I, I, yeah, I mean, not friends, just, right? I, I, fr I would love to be friends with both of them. <laughs> I would say that who I love the most is Federer because uh, I'm, I, I love him because he seems, what fascinates me about him is that he's a person who seems to use joy as his motivation to be the best in the world. Whereas most people who are the best in the world are using anger and spite. Like Michael Jordan, for instance, was motivated by like, he wanted revenge. Like every game was about revenge and that works. Obviously it created Michael Jordan, but Federer doesn't seem to do that. And he could be the best athlete that's ever existed. So I love the way he moves and I love the energy that he brings to, to his game.
Yeah, no, for sure. I'm I'm a Djokovic fan because my husband's Serbian. So if I first of all, if I wasn't, I feel like we wouldn't have gotten married because <laughs> things get intense around That's uh, like the time that he plays. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I think all of them are just it's it's you know it's a debate between who's the best out of the best, right? They're so good. Um, Does your husband but, make an argument for Djokovic being the best of all time? Oh, for sure. He doesn't have of to make time. the argument because I think he is kind of the best of all time. Not kind of, he's the best of all time, it seems to me. Um, but yeah, I think he's definitely, it, it, it gets intense. Like my husband's not huge into sports, but mm -hmm. when Djokovic is playing, it's like things get really intense. I love intense. that. I love that for Serbia. I love that Djokovic, yeah. Djokovic puts Serbia on the map. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, um, this was really, really great. And I feel like, you know, we could keep talking and talking and diving into these, these topics. And there are so many more topics that I feel like you post about that. I'm just like, oh, this would be so, this could be like a whole podcast episode just about the video. <laughs> right. Um, and yeah, this has been an absolute pleasure. How can people find you and contact you? So I'm really active with my community on Instagram. So following me on Instagram at Flynn Skidmore, F-L-Y-N-N-S-K-I-D-M-O-R-E. Um, I have a newsletter that I put out weekly. And what I do with my newsletter is like I, I, I use audience engagement to sort of inform insights and perspectives and questions. So it's like a very responsive newsletter to what people are actually dealing with and going through. So I'm, I'm really liking that a lot. And I also have a, um, an online workshop series. We're about to dive into three months of creating extraordinarily enriching relationships. Um, so that's on, that's a sort of like an online community thing where there are live workshops and like assignments and tasks and all that kind of stuff. So those are, those are the areas where I'm putting the most energy into right now. Awesome. I'll include all the links in the captions of the episode. Thank you so much, Flynn, for your time. Thank you.